this sermon series and I share the first part. The people of God and the people for God or and the people for God, whichever one you prefer. And this is the second part of that message. I want you to turn with me once again to Matthew chapter 16. Let's consider from the verse 17 this time. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I personally prefer the New American Standard Bible's translation of this particular verse, which says, whatever you bind on earth would have been bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth would have been loosed on heaven. Quite specifically because by the grand order, the grand design of things, we don't stand on earth and let's legislate or dis- dictate to heaven, as I was saying. But the privilege that we have in Christ is because we are seated with him in heavenly places, we see from his perspective, then we bind on it, we see from his perspective, and then we lose. So you can't lose what heaven has not loosed. You can't bind what heaven is not binding. Amen. So be careful who you bind. The people you are binding, they are, not, they are not being bound because heaven has not bound them. I just said, I shared that by the way. Now last week I spent some more time on this verse and I'll resist the temptation to do so because this is actually supposed to just be a continuation of the previous message. Now, I will highlight though a number of things. Number one, everybody comes to that point where you are confronted with the person of Jesus Christ. Um, Simon came to that point. He was walking with the man, Jesus of Nazareth, and suddenly he receives a revelation that this is no ordinary person. This is the Messiah himself. This is the Christ in the flesh. Everybody, God will give you a privilege to come to this personal revelation. And when you are confronted with the reality of who Jesus is, you have a decision to make. So there's confrontation and there's revelation. Now that revelation can be aided by man, but it's primarily a divine revelation. It is something that has to proceed from God. So an instructor, a teacher, your parents, your mom, your dad can help you to come to the place where Christ is interesting or you want to inquire further about him. But God really is the one, by his spirit, who reveals Jesus to us. And that revelation is not Jesus as a teacher. It's not Jesus as a prophet. It's not Jesus as one of the many ways to God, but Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God. My prayer is that you have seen him and you have embraced him. Now, upon that revelation, you have to acknowledge there's that acceptance. From that place of acceptance, you can't hold back. You must confess. So traditionally, all throughout the scheme or throughout history, the history of the people who have come to be known as the, the people of God, the body of Christ, you can't keep Jesus within you. There's nothing like a secret be- believer. It comes to that point where you must confess your conviction. What has en- uh, encapsulated your very being, what has captured your heart, your essence. You can't keep him in. You can't store him in. You have to confess. You have to say something. So when we declare that Jesus is Lord, it's from a place of deep conviction. It's an inner knowing. It's not something that is theoretical. It's not a head kind of knowledge or revelation, but it's from deep within. Now, if you want to understand some of the other aspects of this passage, you have to listen to last week's sermon. I spoke specifically 
about the gates of Hades and what was happening in the particular place that they were standing in, the territory or the town called Caesarea Philippi. Uh, I will, again, emphasize on this, that Jesus says to Peter, there's a play on words here when he says to him, now you are Peter. The word there is Petros. It's a rock, but it's a small rock. It's like a pebble, a soft rock. So he's saying you are Peter, but on this revelation, the revelation not of that tiny rock, but on the great rock himself, the rock who alone is Jesus, on this rock. So that word there that you see is Petra, that is like a boulder, it's like a rock, a rock rock. Not the rock, not WWE the rock. Even the rock must come to believe that there is a rock of ages. Amen. On this rock, I will build my church. On that revelation of the person of Jesus, he is going to construct something. So Jesus is in the habit of construction. He's a builder. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus is building us as a people. We are his assembly. As we looked at last week, we are his gathering. We are his people. And the way he's constructing us, Nothing can stop us. We are unstoppable, we are unmovable, we are unshakable because we are founded on the rock. First Corinthians chapter 3, the verse 9 and 10. First Corinthians chapter 3, the verse 9 and 10. For we are God's fellow workers. Someone say God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Paul is saying, now we, we, we who give instruction or or, or proclaim the word, we are God's fellow workers. So when God enlists you in his army, you become his co-laborer. And God's building, God's building. So clearly stated, we see that God is the one who is what? Building us. You are building for God. Verse 10. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds. Okay, so he's talking more about apostles, uh, teachers, builders, literally, but and he's saying that God is building. Now, everybody should be careful how he builds, but that also applies to you. God is building you, but be mindful how you build your life. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. Because it's a teaching service, we have quite a number of scriptures, so do stay with me. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So the purpose of God's construction is that he will dwell inside of you. God is building us. He's Each and every one of us, we are building blocks of that which he's constructing. But the purpose is that he will dwell in us. So say I'm a place for God's dwelling. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. We're not only being built, so God does not build you your life individually, but your life is connected to the other. You see how this building is standing because there's uh, there are pillars. And they are building blocks. Those building blocks are not standing in isolation. The building cannot come up if the blocks are standing in isolation. So he's building us together. Your life by necessity is contingent or there's an impact that another's life has on you. For you to stand, for you to be effective in the body of Christ, you, you cannot be isolated. When Jesus called his disciples, he did not say to Peter, Peter, you are from Galilee. I'm going to meet you in Galilee. Now, you who are from maybe Judea, just wait for me there. I'll meet you in Judea. No, he brought all of them together. So you can't be in isolation and say, I'll encounter God there. There's an aspect, there's a dimension of him that you catch, you encounter. But there's something that happens when believers come together. 
And his purpose is that he's building us what? together. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Is your life founded on Jesus? As a believer, as a child of God, every ministry, every church must be built on the foundation of Jesus. We're not built on men. We're not built on tradition, not on doctrine, but on the person of Jesus Christ. So the church is founded on the rock, the great rock himself. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. It says, Behold, I lay in Zion a cornerstone, a chief cornerstone. Okay, this, this is the verse 5. Let's take the verse 5 and we'll go to verse 6. You also as living stones. So, he's building, all of us are building blocks, but you are not concrete. You are living, you are alive, you are breathing. Now, the life that is in you is the eternal life of God. Someone say, I'm living. It's that eternal life of God. So your life is supposed to be fruitful. Your life is supposed to be productive. Your life is also supposed to flow out to others. In the same way that God himself is life. And he is light. In that same way, his life is in you. We are being built up a spiritual house. So I mentioned last week, if we came together and we discussed every other thing. I talked about the, the challenges that we have of our time where people gather in the name of God. Yet the Bible is not open. People gather in the name of God. Listen, you, prophecy doesn't make it church. People prophesy by spirit of divination. People pick up the spirit realm is wide and it's, it's vast. You can, you can access it through many means. The fact that someone came in and they started to prophesy and started to call people's phone numbers does not make it church. They can even enter your home and start to describe your furniture to you. It does not make it church. It's a spiritual house. It's the life of God that is in that place. We are being built up a holy priesthood. So the people of God, as you come in day in and day out, it's not necessarily that God will bless you alone. That is good. Everybody wants blessing. And God by nature, listen, how can you walk with God and you not bless you? Then you don't know the God we are talking about. It is in his nature. By necessity, he must drop something small for you. Are you following me? But his purpose, the reason why he's building you is that you will become a holy priesthood. There's an altar that you must service concerning God. There's sacrifice that pertains regarding your life. You, you are not to live life alone. You are called into the service of God. You are a holy priesthood. Holy means you are set apart. You are Sanctify. So we are not talking about the priest that is in your village or that sits in a hut somewhere. These are holy men and holy women of God. Someone say, I'm holy. I'm set apart. I'm like no other. The world has not seen the likes of me. I'm set apart for God. Your life, you must live your life as one who is set apart for God. You're a holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. When we talk about sacrifice, this day and age, what the church knows only about sacrifice is money. Money. Your life must be a sweet smelling fragrance. An offering unto God. If you've not offered your life, God does not want anything else that proceeds from you. God, to a point in time, the Lord said concerning Israel, you people are disturbing me with your chant and your praise, your prayers. You are disturbing your... Listen, when, you're, you're, when you, you, you make sacrifices, they, they disturb the atmosphere of heaven. 
Go back with your sacrifices. What God is looking for is your heart. Offer your heart to him. Offer yourself to him. They are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Because they are going through Jesus, they are acceptable to God. If you don't go through him, it's not acceptable. Now, key point in all that I've said is that God is building and he's building on Christ Jesus. He's building on that dynamic, powerful rock. If God is building you on the rock, that means that you are going to be solid. When there are shakings, when there are storms, when there's confusion all over, friend, if you are standing on Jesus Christ, your life is secure. You'll be unshakable. You'll be unmovable. Now, if you are not on Jesus, and you are but that same Jesus that you see, he's unlimited in scope and in dimension. So if you are, you, again, your life is being built on him, it means that the body of Christ itself is unlimited in scope. The body of Christ cannot be shaken. So the gates of Hades, Satan himself cannot prevail against you. What I'm building. So there are times where it will come. You see, the, 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 the function of ministry, the, of believers, means that you engage with the evil of the world. Means that there will be time where there are challenges. Anybody who says to you that come to Jesus and all problems will be solved, there will be no problem, is, is, is deceiving you. That's not the gospel. In this life you face tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world, Jesus said. It is guaranteed if you are a child of God, you will face challenges. Because every man faces trouble. The answer is, how do you overcome? Are you riding over or on the waves? Or are you going to go down under? That's the difference. Because if you're a child of God, what he, the guarantee for you, if you are part of the body, is that you're going to ride on the waves. As Jesus walked on water, so you are going to walk on the water. The storms will still hit you, but you're not going to go down. And so this morning, my prayer for you, anybody who is facing any kind of trouble, challenge, affliction, whatsoever, you are standing on the rock, and you are unmovable, you are unshakable. You're unlimited in the mighty name of Jesus. Paul said to the believers in court. He said concerning Christ, that he was with them in the wilderness. He said they were baptized in the baptism of Moses. And he followed them as the rock. So that when you say that you are built on Jesus... It's not only a literal construction, but that rock provides sustenance, provides water for you even in the time of the wilderness, the most difficult, most challenging times. Amen. And it's life that is flowing through him services us. I want you to write this down. The, the church is so dynamic that every time you look at the scriptures, you can find, you can come up with different definitions for the church. So I have another one for you today. We are an assembly of God's people. The church is an assembly of God's people being built up into Jesus Christ. He is a great monarch ruling in their midst. The center of every activity. That's why we were singing at the center of it all is you that I see. If you don't see Jesus, if you go into a church and you don't see Jesus there, my friend, get out of there very quickly. The center of every activity, everything must be connected to him. It must be about him. He must drive and facilitate everything. And they are filled with the Holy Spirit as they live on mission daily to advance the kingdom of God on the earth. Can we increase the font a bit? If you want to capture it. Let me read that. An assembly of God's people 
being built up into Jesus Christ, the great monarch or the king, ruling in their midst, the center of every activity. They are filled with the Holy Spirit as they live on mission daily to advance the kingdom of God on the earth. Emphasizing living on mission is important because we don't got that for God's sake. The church is not a social club. We are people on mission. I mentioned to you last week that a few people in a couple of weeks, they came together, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. And suddenly, it was said in just a few weeks that they filled the whole of Jerusalem with their doctrine. So it must be. My prayer for you and I is that it will be said of us, we have filled all of Accra, all of Ghana with Jesus Christ. The church birthed by the Spirit of God. In Acts chapter 2, the verse 1, the Bible says that on that day, the day of Pentecost, when the day had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Remember, we've said that the the church, the ecclesia, is the gathering. Okay? So what you, you begin to see here is the birthing of the church. We are laying foundations. I'm speaking, some of what I'll say is applicable to you, but I'm speaking, understanding that I'm speaking to those who are here now and even those who are going to listen to this later. Okay? They were with one accord in one place. We are a gathering of God's people. But when we gather, there must be oneness. The reason why we, we have gathered must be clear. So that's one of the things you have to look out for when you are joining a church. Do I agree with what is being said? With the vision, with the direction? Do I agree? Is it biblical? Is it scripture? And do I, can I commit to it? That's why we encourage people, when you come in and you're joining the church, discover every nation. Come in and discover. Because, friend, it does not make sense to keep going, to keep going, and you don't know where we are going. It's not good for you. Amen? So they were with one accord. Together. Oneness of heart, oneness of mind. Not conformity. We're talking about unity in the spirit, the bond of the spirit. We're not saying that everybody should become one. Thankfully, I don't have any elegant head. Hair, hair watch, watch. You know. Hair style that you can copy. <laughs> they were with one accord in one place. Next verse, verse 2. And suddenly, the Bible says that suddenly, someone says suddenly. There was a sound. Of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now we come to know that that wind was the wind of the spirit. In John chapter 3 verse 8. It says that. Concerning the Holy Spirit. It says the wind blows. Whichever way it, it wants. And you are not able to discern or detect. Where it is going. Where it is from and where it is going. And so is anyone who is born of the Spirit. So there are people who are birthed by the Spirit of God. Now suddenly, this man, this man, young woman, you can't comprehend their operations. You can't, you can't tell where their life is going to end. Before they were smoking, they were sleeping around. They're like, oh man, there's a way that's simmered right onto man. But the end thereof is death. And you're like, where you are leading is going to lead to the grave. You're going down. You're going under. But suddenly the spirit of the Lord comes upon them. And when you can't tell what is going to happen. You, can't, you, you just know it's something glorious. It's something marvelous. But you can't comprehend. There's like an entire dimension that is not open to them. And a, a whole level of possibilities that are in God, that are available now to him. And suddenly your life changes. Your life is transformed. Now you're part of the body. So that's what you see beginning to happen there in Acts chapter 2. Now the verse 2 now. 
Okay, so the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them. He fills the whole house where they are sitting. Next verse, verse 3. Then there appeared unto them divided tongues of fire that sat on each one of them. So you are seeing, again, the birth of the church, the birth of the church. The Bible goes on to say, now they began to speak in tongues. The Bible is very interesting. You know, when you read from Genesis chapter 8, uh, I beg your pardon, chapter 1, the, the account of the formation of the earth. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now verse 2, in the earth was formless and void and darkness covered the surface of the deep. Now it goes on to say, now the Holy Spirit was brooding over the surface. He was hovering around. The next verse, then God said, in us, the people gathered together with one accord. As they were sitting down, they were praying. Their, their hearts, Jesus said, God is going to release a the promise of the Father unto us. And they are, they are waiting on him. They are crying out, Lord, as the prophet Joel said, let it be. We let the promise of the Lord come. They are praying. They are waiting. Sudden the spirit of the Lord comes upon them. Then it goes on to say in the verse 14, then Peter rose up because people began to mock and they began to scoff. You have to understand when the spirit of the Lord is moving upon you, they will be mocking. Ah. But may the Lord turn the mockings of the enemy into celebrations and shouts of joy for you and testimonies for you. So they were mocking now. Peter got up and began to proclaim the word. And as he began to proclaim the word, the church is born. The church is birthed. That very day, 3,000 people were saved. They were added to the church. That's how the church is born. That's how God creates. The spirit of the Lord comes upon the territory, comes upon the people and the word is proclaimed. So when we are talking about the business of church, the entity is called church. Number one, the spirit of God. Because according to Isaiah chapter 32 verse 15, until the spirit is poured out from on high, the desert place remains a wilderness. Nothing can happen until the spirit is what? Poured so we can't gather except by the spirit of God. Are you following me? There's nothing. We, we can't achieve anything in this nation unless by the Spirit of God. But even though the Spirit of God has come upon us and has called us and has pulled us together from far and near and He's empowering us as we proclaim the word. I'm talking about church. Because people don't understand what the church is. You know, there's a pastoral dimension of church. So there's care and I'm going, going to that now. There are needs and their wants, their cares. But primarily, that's not what church is about. Those are expressions as the people gather because they are human beings. They'll be needs. Are you following me? But the key ingredient you have to look out for when we talk about the institution of church is the spirit of God and the word of God. Because we live in an age where, as I was saying before, people go into church and they don't look out for these things. Now chapter 4, verse 31. One more point on this. One more scripture on this. Acts chapter 4 verse 31. The Bible says that the, 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 the apostles, they had been preaching the word and they were persecuted because they are performing a miracle and there were all kinds of skirmishes around it. But they gathered after they had been persecuted. They still gathered. After they had been persecuted, they still gathered. Don't stop following Jesus because you face an affliction. Our journey has not started. We have not, don't stay away because you are facing challenges. They were in prison, they were lashed. And they guarded. In fact, they were happy. They were, eat. <laughs> How many did they lash you? <laughs> they were celebrating. They said, oh, you see, this, this is nice, eh? You know, we were, we were waiting. When they were kneeling Jesus and we ran away, we were, we, we, we were waiting. When will we ever get this opportunity again? Show me your marks. And they were laughing. They gathered and they prayed. I said, I said to someone, show me your marks. Oh, I can stay here the whole day. The place where they were assembled together was shaking. 
Because they gathered, they caught the revelation in the midst of persecution. They prayed and there was a shaking in that place. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit again. And what happened? And they spoke the word of God with boldness. That's how God creates. That's how God forms the church. The Spirit of God and the Word of God. The Spirit of God and the Word of God. I want you to say with me, the Spirit of God and the Word of God. No Word, no church. No Spirit, no church. Church is no business. You can't rubbish the name of Jesus Christ like that. The church needs to wake up. Going and going. The Lord grant me grace. So last week I left off, I gave you five characteristics when the people of God gather, what you look out for. I gave you five. This one I'm going to try to give you the rest of the seven. Because we have to end this at some points. So number six, family. For those of you, of you who are not around, sorry, I can't, I can't go back. <laughs> family. Number six, family. Psalm 68 from verse five and six. Family. Psalm 68 from verse 5 and 6. A father of the fatherless. The church is a family. God is who? Father. He's a father of the fatherless. A defender of widows. Oh, James talks about widows. We need to take care of each other. Eh? Widows is God in his holy habitation. The location is where? God's holy habitation. Mount Zion. All right. Next verse. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in the dry land. When you are isolated, when you are lonely, God sets the solitary where in from He brings you into spiritual family. So you have to understand that there are aspects of the church which is supposed to be family. Because people don't like, you know, my business, my Okay, you be here and I'll be here. Just do your thing. You do us. You do you. I don't mean. So don't, you know, this church, just, you just come and worship and just go. No, friend. We are talking about another institution. You are talking about something else. You are talking about something that you've, uh, uh, you've come up with in your mind. If we are talking about the body of Christ, we are talking family. Is someone following me? Some of the good aspects that you see in your natural family. Let me not even go far. Some of the good things. Huh? Not the bad ones. The bad ones, they are not in God's family. Let's put them somewhere. But the good ones, we are supposed to mimic them. Okay? Because we have so many different cultures here. Time will <laughs> take too long to try to break that down. Okay, so you just start. That's a, a, a basic revelation you can start with. All the good things you see your father did. All the things, good things you see your, your mother did. Your, the uncle that you love so much. That you will find all were in the body of Christ. But the rebellious, these are the people who say, nobody should talk about my business. I've been a rebel before and I was in church. In fact, um, understanding that I was a rebel, I, I stopped going to church. Because I'm like, okay, Lord, I can't be a hypocrite. You God, you just wait. But, you know, when I'm ready, so I know what that feels like. We have a lot of rebels in church. And that, what I basically mean by that is people who don't want to open up. They want to, how's that person? Right after the service, I'll, I'll be out. That, you know, what, you, uh, what I see in this church is really beautiful. People hang around and they stay. It's good. Please, let's maintain that, okay? If you see us losing that, you can call the church to order. Is that okay? can say, I noticed that these days we have become too business-like. When we finish, it's like everybody is in a hurry. We have become, you know, very business-like in operation. No, 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 no. Amen? Psalm 84, verse 1, and 1 to 4. 84, verse 1 to 4. It feels like I'm just starting a sermon. Oh, my word. Psalm 84. 84, please. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. I want you to pay attention to the location, okay? O Lord of hosts, verse 2. It's lovely, the body of Christ, the is where God is. Remember, where construction, God is there. He's reigning in our midst. It's beautiful. Say, I'm beautiful. My soul longs, yes, faints for the cause of the Lord. When you're coming to church, this must be the desire. 
He said, ah, my soul longs. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the building. Remember, we covered that. Okay, let me not go back. I'm talking about the people. My soul longs to see a brother or a sister in, uh, because I see God in them. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. That's the posture. It's, it, there must be a longing, a desire for God that I will encounter him in this place. Next verse. Even the sparrow has found a home. And the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. We used to pray this scripture a couple of years ago. Those of you who were here from the beginning, you know. As I said, the church, what God is building here, even a sparrow will find a home. The, 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 the psalmist was looking at the elegant temple that Solomon built. And at the end of it, he says, Solomon, you came up with a design that even a sparrow will find a home. Oh, every nation, let it be that even the smallest of the birds, the people, the people who feel even the smallest in life, find a home. Amen. Next verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed are those who what? Who dwell. Blessed are those who dwell. They don't visit. Please visit churches. Please try to figure out what is going on. You're visiting, that's good. But moving from church to church will not help you. It is those who dwell, who abide, who are blessed. So many times believers struggle. They're like, oh God, I've been crying, I've been praying. I've been a child of God. I've been in this church. I've been in ministry. I was in this ministry. I did X, Y, Z. I was this one. I did X, Y, Z. No, there are, there are seasons in life, okay? My background is with another ministry. In fact, a number of them since I was born. And then finally God led me into a spiritual form. So it happens. So you dwell, you might dwell in a, in a place for a season, you might dwell in another place for a season. But what I'm talking about is this Sunday, you are in this church because there's a man of God there, he, he prophesies, but uh, listen, he, this is my day, he's going to pick me. Now, next week Sunday, okay, now you're another church because the, the man is anointed, healing. Hmm. If he does this, no, you fall down. So you are there. That's what I'm talking about. Are you following me? Today, this Sunday you are here. Next Sunday you are here. You will not, you are not abiding. Your roots cannot take ground. Amen. So you need. In John chapter 8 verse 35, it says a slave does not abide in the house. John 8 35. It's a son who dwells. So we're talking about family. Father, you have sons. Dwell in a house. Come to that place. If the Lord just allows me to speak on this. I'll stay on it. We're talking family. Spiritual family. Some of you, maybe you are like me. You didn't have a good um, image of family. Maybe you didn't grow up in a home where mother and father are present. So you are very suspicious about families. It's very, very suspicious about things that have got to do with authority. You know, where there are limits, you're like, you're very, very suspicious. But that's God's design, okay? God is what? Father. And he's king. So in his family, there is what? Order. Because we are family also, it means that by necessity, one auntie must poke their nose in your business. It must happen. You cannot be, I can't speak for other churches, but let me speak for this one. You cannot be in this church. You are a young lady, you are a young guy. iPhone, if I ever comes, you have it. The latest one drops, you have it. Okay. Maybe your parents are rich. So I will find out. <laughs> if your parents are, God bless you. We thank God for your parents. We want 
rich parents, they should keep blessing you with iPhones. If my father, they should buy you a car. When you do well in school, they should buy you a car and drive it around and say, my father bought it for me. There's no problem about that. We celebrate that. You're not working. The latest wig, you have it. We will find out. I'm not, I'm not, I told you, I've, this is point six, I, I can't go on. We will find out. You are a young boy, a young guy. Today you are driving unlicensed Mercedes Benz. Tomorrow you are driving Range Rover. <laughs> and you come and sit in a chair. When they say offering this, you give offering this. We will, um, we will find out. Because it is not your money. If we go, read the Bible, Paul Peter said to somebody, you perish with your money. You come and sit in church and you are a politician. Eh? And you, you send an alert. I get information. Maybe finance informs me that there is some alert hit the church account. This one is not alert, it's alarm. <laughs> we will call you and say, uh, uh, excuse me, sir. God bless you. Don't be offended. Uh, but something has shaken the church. We want to find out. Tell me, is this legitimate money? If you are offended, you can pack up and go. Because you have, it. listen, if you go and take money that is meant to be built for hospitals, and pregnant women are dying, you have blood on your hands. You come and put that money in the church offering. And you say that you, God bless him for one We don't know the God that we are talking about. The church has lost its way. Because it's family, we must find out. If you are offended, there's a scripture I'll give you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. I will not read it because if you read it, people will get offended. But you go and read it. <laughs> go and read it. And you see that one day, any church leader will account to God. And so we can't keep quiet. Amen. You must be clear what you do. You must be clear if you're in a relationship. There are limits. Number seven. It's related. I'll put them together. Number seven and number eight. They're all connected with this one. Pastoral care. John chapter 10, verse 1 to 5. John chapter 10, verse 1 to 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the, but by the door, but come, climbs up another way, the same is a thief and a robber. Verse 2. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Number four. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Next verse. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. No, don't listen to just anything and just anybody. Know the voice. I mentioned last week that... When we say the voice of the shepherd, Jesus is the chief shepherd. So what you want to know is the voice of Christ Jesus in the shepherd, in the under shepherd. Are you following me? You have to be able to discern the voice of Christ in the shepherd. First Peter chapter 5, verse 2. If we have the New Living Translation, you can use that. First Peter chapter 5, verse 2. Care for the flock that God has entrusted you. Our job is not easy. <laughs> watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. For watch, not for what you get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. 
That is our heart here. It's because we fear God and we are eager to serve him. Primarily, it's not even to serve people. Though. Because if you, your, your heart is to serve people, you, you get frustrated. You get annoyed. You get angry. People will not, you not like what they say and how they behave and how they look. But if it's to serve God, you receive strength from you. You draw strength from you. It says, serve. This scripture is usually quoted during the ordinations for pastors. But I believe it's applicable also for all of us since we are in a body we are also caring for each other. So there's welfare in church. There's counseling that takes place in church. And we do all that with the voice of God. There is care that must, must take place. Over here, there's a system of care. So let me use this opportunity to again speak it. When sometimes people f- have challenges, personal, their financial needs, they're scared. That is provided. And if you are there like that, you speak to any of the leaders. Because we don't want the situation. As families, the Bible says, always says you have to take care of your own first. We can't have you know, people facing challenges here. And then we say we are going to donate to... Uh, yeah, our bro, you are going to donate to Kolibu. Okay? That's good. But Jesus will tell you, this you should have done without neglecting the former. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. And I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will guide you with knowledge and understanding. So part of being in family is you have to receive guidance. You have to be willing to receive guidance and to receive knowledge, to receive teaching primarily. So guidance for your life. Amen. Now, however, that does not mean, there are limits to that. That does not mean that we detect every part of your life. Uh, Pastor, I have this job and this job. Which one should I pick? Go and pray. Go and think. And use wisdom. Go and pros and cons of, of both sides and, and find out. I'll pray for you that God helps you. Even if I see it, that's the, the purpose is not to raise people who are just so reliant on the shepherds. Are you following me? Because you're supposed to be ministers of the gospel yourself and become shepherds. Minister to each other and minister to the body. So we give care, we give counsel, but there are limits to it. So over here, don't come and say, Pastor, who should I marry? Professor, who should I marry? We <laughs> listen. No, 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 no. That's not that's not the purpose of, of the care we have. Even if I sit, I will close my eyes. I will not tell you. Because if you, if you go, you, you, they, they pass, you prophesied that that's my wife. That's not church, oh, please. That's not church. There are limits to that. Number eight. Number eight. Is it possible? Let me try. Number eight, restoration. Restoration, discipline, and reconciliation. Okay? Restoration, discipline, and reconciliation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 4. Now from the verse 1, Paul had been dealing with an issue. In the church of Corinth, now this church was very spiritual. Oh my word. Huh. When they spoke in tongues, people would interpret. They, they, all the gifts were being made manifest there. But there was an issue in the church. Someone's, some, some young guy was sleeping with his father's wife. Are you following me? Someone say church. Yeah, church. Somebody was sleeping with his father's wife. Eh? Church. Is that okay? It's not. Because the church is a place for sick people. And, and I'm number one here. Hello. If you say you are not sick, then you don't need a church. Jesus said, I came. What? As a physician, he came to what? Heal the sick. So this was what was happening in the church. But Paul said, no, 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 we can't. Is it verse, that's the verse 4. Give me the verse 4. Verse 7, 5, 4. So it says, in the name of the Lord Jesus, you must call a meeting of the church. He says, now when you call the meeting, I will be present with you in spirit. And so will the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next verse. Then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan. 
so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved by it on the day the Lord returns. If this man is the mayor of the, of the city, should he be thrown out? Yes. He will be thrown out. What Paul is saying is that, listen, there are limits to this thing. You can't be in the body of Christ and we tolerate everything. Is that okay? Now, he, this guy was unrepentant. That's why Paul was giving that. So when you have, we have challenges, you just... Doctor, I'm sick. Hello? Doctor, if you are, let's not pretend. If right now we should start scanning, everybody here, there are issues. So why, why do we pretend? I was telling Mami Sawa yesterday, one of the things I love about Full Gospel, hey, I went to Full Gospel meeting. I was invited. I went to Full Gospel meeting. I listened to a testimony. I said, this is testimony. What? The man is, after he gave the testimony, the way the whole room, you know, was quiet, he said, don't judge me. That was, <laughs> <laughs> the testimony was heavy. <laughs> I said, and we all laughed. Why, why don't, let's not pretend that everything is okay. No, we are just a bunch of sick people. God is helping us. Oh. It's the Holy Spirit who is just helping us. So if you are sick, just come and say, I'm sick. Are you following me? Uh, because if you stay with it, it's a little leaven, leaven the whole lump. So if you have COVID and you don't come and say I'm sick for you to start throwing, we are going to get COVID. <laughs> Spiritual COVID, hallelujah. It came to cause sinners to repentance. That's a good physician. Number nine, evangelism. We're talking about church, We're talking evangelism. Because the church is a people on mission. Uh, you can't gather today, uh, com- this committee. Building committee. Car for the pastor committee. <laughs> and people are, are dying. Yeah, you're, you're going to go into heaven with people <laughs> who were at the conference. One of our pastors from China. We can't even mention this because of security issues. Communion. He was serving the communion. How are we all going to go into this heaven in the same place? With the same concern? Is that this man, his life is every day is on the risk. In fact, the, the, the government, they've come, we, say, we know what you're doing. And they are still meeting, they are still gathering. If they catch him, the day they will catch him, they will put him in some dungeon, they will not, they will, they will not, they will not be seen anymore. When you, like, he, the person was offering, you could see the meaning. He was sobbing, he was... Weeping as he was serving the communion. So church cannot be about just fun and games. And We are going to go into heaven with people who are dying. Who are dying for their faith. We are a people on mission. And it's every day. Mark chapter 5. From 18 to 19. Jesus, after he had healed this young man. Who was bound by demons. The boy was trying to follow him. He said, no, go, 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 go. Go and preach the gospel. Go and, go, and t- go and say it all over people, all over the, over the city, what I've done for you. Okay? Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Proverbs 11, verse 30. The f- Is it? Check, I beg your pardon, check 32. No, 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 30. Give me the new King James. The new living translation says the fruit, that's what I'm looking for. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Someone say my fruit is a tree of life. So this is what counts in eternity. You, you are a tree yourself. When you read someone, you see, you're a tree. Now, the question you'll be asked is, which other tree did you produce? Are you righteous? Are you righteous? You are righteous if you don't know. I'm telling you, you are righteous because you've been made righteous. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, you're righteous. So, the, tree, the fruit of the righteous, the fruit you must produce what is another tree. You can't enter into heaven alone. A whole tree you were on the earth for 80 years. Even if it's 30 years, 33 years like Jesus, they ask you, how many trees do you come? He who wins souls is 
is wise. That's why we are here. That men must be saved. In a simple way, sometimes that's you have to you have to invite. Listen, if you are coming on the street, you see people. You say, have you been to church? Just call them. Just if you are going to church, just bless them. Okay, encourage them to go to their church. But don't don't just bless them. So we are here for that. Now to get, we put this uh, evangelism together with discipleship. Matthew chapter twenty-eight. If you are in this church, it's one of the scriptures you have to know. Matthew twenty-eight verse nine, from nineteen to twenty. The, previous, the preceding verse is, all authority in heaven has been given to me. Therefore, go. Okay? So, discipleship requires power. Requires authority. And it's been given to us. Because Jesus commissioned us. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. We are discipling this nation. We are, we are discipling the community, the campuses, young people. We are, we, we look, we are, looking at, we are like, what course are you doing? Law. Come, let's disciple you. Before... Somebody goes to corrupt you. Why are you a business student? Come, let's disciple you. So that when you become a successful businessman, you will not be, you know, corrupt and be destroying the system. Finance? Come, let's disciple you. Uh, when you are a finance minister, you will not put weight and yoke on us. Shackle us with all kinds of loans that are children and their children. Come and let's disciple you. Don't just go to church. Because if you, you say you're a Christian, you say, I know God. No, let's disciple you. You serve like Christ. As a finance minister. Someone say amen. amen. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. You know, the reason why we are not out there is because we are dying. <laughs> By the time we come, we are dead already. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. How many sermons have you not heard? How many teachings? Take one. Just commit to somebody. And say, you to teach somebody. We say, have something we say, one chapter ahead. Discipleship. I know Jesus is Lord and his Savior. You know that Jesus is Savior. I will disciple you. Are you following me? That's, I, the only thing I know is that he is Lord and he is Savior. You know that he is Savior. Now, because I also know that he is Lord, I will disciple you. I don't have to know everything in the Bible. One chapter ahead. Disciple somebody. In the church, there must be growth. Opportunity for growth and maturity. So, this is number 11. Growth and maturity. And this happens primarily through service. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 to 16. Because we have to end this some way, somehow. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Okay? There's a measure of grace that God has given to us. And one of the things that Jesus did was he gave gifts to the church. Now, this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Oh, that's why you have to come to prayer Friday service. Eh? We, we consider all these things. He, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Yes, Jesus, he did not, before you can ascend, you have to descend. It's a, it's a principle in the Bible, it's scripture. For Christian, if, for your manifestation, for the there's a dying, you have to die. Okay? All right, that's just by the way. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For the equipping, number 12, verse 12 is the emphasis. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. What are we being equipped for? Work of ministry. So ask yourself, are you working in a ministry? Are you working in a ministry? We're talking church. It's not about attendance. Nobody's going to count attendance in heaven. How many services do you go to? What did you do? What did your life, how did your life impact people? For the edifying of the body of Christ. So Jesus said, for my body to be edified, to be built up, work. And you say you know work. How would the body be built up? Verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we are being built up. We must work. Psalm 92 verse 13. It says those who are planted in, in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Those who are planted. It's not not those who visit, oh. 
Those who are planted. If you want to flourish, you must be planted. Say, I must be planted. Go to, now go to the preceding verse. The verse 12 very quickly. Psalm 92, verse 12. Psalm 92, verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. Okay, so if you read just the, the verse 12, you say, oh, I'll flourish. Hallelujah. A palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. But then you read the 13, you say, no, 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 no. It doesn't end there. It is actually those who are planted who will become like the cedar in Lebanon. Amen. Finally, finally. Can't you thank God that after the long preaching, I'm done. <laughs> finally, prayer. Prayer. No prayer, no church. Churches that don't pray are dangerous. Churches that don't teach the word are dangerous. And churches don't, who don't, that don't pray are if Jesus enters that church today, he will lash everybody. Matthew chapter 21, verse 13 and 14. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. The house is not for merchandising. Verse 14. And the blind and the lame came to see him in the temple and he healed them. I was praying with Pastor Newman one day and he made reference to this scripture. I said, oh, wow, I've not seen this before. He said, listen, it was after Jesus had cleared the temple, lashed everybody, that the blind and the lame came to see. So there are still many lame and blind people in the body of Christ, in the city, in the nation, because the church is not praying. Because when the church should be praying, the church is merchandising. When you rise up in prayer, the blind and the lame can begin to see. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 12 to 13. And the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. Remember, we are called as a royal priesthood. A holy priesthood. There's an altar you have to service. It says, that altar, okay, the fire on it shall be kept burning. The altar on the, on, in your heart the, the place of affection for God, it must be burning continually. And it burns primarily by the word of God and by the spirit of God. No word, no passion for God. Sometimes you're like, this Jesus thing, I'm not sure. This Christianity thing. Listen, you can't even be dying and be calling on Jesus. Yes, Jesus, son of God, save me. Yes, son of God. And not stop praying. Not that because you are suffering, you are stop praying. No. It's just like I'm dying, I will not take the medicine. I have cancer, I will not do chemo. I'm, I'm angry with the doctor, so I'm not him. <laughs> you, you die and go to heaven. <laughs> it must be kept burning. It shall not be put out. Someone say it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. All priest of God. All royal priesthood. The Bible says, I should tell you this morning, the altar in your heart, you must burn wood on it every morning. Every morning you must say something to God. Every morning you have to pray. You have to communicate to your father. Let it burn. And lay the burnt offering in order on it. Your life must be in order. You can't go and offer God anything. I told you already. Your life must be the first sacrifice on the altar. Sometimes you have to come to him and say, Lord, I give my heart. I rededicate my life to you. you know, there are Christians who, it's not, it's not theologically, um, you know, I will not make doctrine out of it. Okay, so this is not the Bible said. It's just advice. It's an advice. That sometimes you have to renew your covenant. There are times where you are in your room, you are praying, and you just have to come to the Lord and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I was a sinner. And you saved me. I renew my covenant with you. I was lost. But now I'm found. Christians who you go, you just we knew your covenant with God. That's how you keep the intimacy. You keep. Even married people, after marriage, after 10 years, don't look at my wife, we are 11 years. You know. <laughs> married after 10 years, they are doing renewal of vows. Renewal of vows. Renew your vows with God. That, like that day, that day when you got saved. Christians don't confess their sin anymore. Confess your sins. And 
it shall burn on it the fat. He shall burn on it the fat of the peace of friends. You got to pray, friends. The church must be reserved for him faith because we're going to pray this morning. The vitality and the vibrancy if the church will be effective is the word and prayer. This morning we are going to pray. Because the enemy has laid a challenge. You know we say that nobody will die before their time. And the, body, the enemy has laid a challenge. Just begin to pray. Concerning your life, anything that concerns you. Say, Lord, together we come, we put our faith together. We come together as a body, as your body, as priests, royal priesthood. This morning we recommit ourselves into your hands. This morning, Lord, any place of in affection, in any place where we've lost our desire for you, ignite us on fire again. That we will be a building set apart for you. A building set apart for you. This is what the Lord is building in us. Lord, prepare me a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true With thanksgiving, I'll be a living. Can we have the communion? Hey, hey, hey. Lord, prepare me. Lord, prepare oh, oh, oh. me. To be a sanctuary. Pure and holy. Pure and holy. Rade mene kimana no sere. Tried and true. With thanksgiving. I'll be a living. Sanctuary. I want you to sing this with me and say, With thanksgiving, I'll be. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living. I'll be a living. Sanctuary. Sanctuary. For. 